Uh, right now, it's time for uh, University of Manchester, Angelo Cangelosi, Professor Angelo Cangelosi and Professor Tia Cameron Faulkner. Are you here, Tia? Ah, yes, yeah, I can see you. Excellent. So, Angelo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So this is a joint talk uh, with TI and me. So I will start uh, with the computational aspects of the expertise in our university. And then Tia will talk about developmental approaches to the field. I'm going to give an overview of the approach. And you can see that even on, in the computational side, the cognitive robotics lab in, in the Department of Computer Science, we actually use a strongly psychological oriented approach. So although our main goal as computationalists is to design better robots, in particular to design capabilities in robots to use language, but not like an Alexa type of approach, is to use language that the robot itself understands. We call this the symbol grounding problem, or in our case, the symbol grounding solution, let's say. So this is the primary goal. I say normally in my talks, this is 51% of, of my aim, but, but there is a remaining 49%, which is also an interest in modern cognition, with machines, with robots, and use these tools to better understand natural cognition, human cognition, animal cognition, and so on, which is exactly what we will be doing this project, right? We want to develop better technologies, but we also want to understand cognition better using computational tools and robots in this case. So this will represent the robotics, AI, computer science element of the project. For, and then of course, there will be the psychology and neuroscience, which includes, of course, Thea's uh, contribution in the second part. And I'm going to give a very brief overview of two types of models we use here. The first one focuses on grounding concrete words, and then the next part will focus on grounding abstract words, of course, which is the focus of our project. So the way we do this is we work in close collaboration with baby labs, the developmental psychology labs. So you will see an example in a moment of our very first study with Linda Smith in Indiana, the US. Then we did work with Jessica Horst in Sussex, the south of England, Flotchen Catan in Plymouth, Marchetti new collaboration with Milan Cattolica University, and of course, the collaboration with Manchester, two uh, main researchers in the field, in addition to Kea, to Thea Cameron Falconer, we also collaborate with Katie to me. We used to collaborate actually even before moving to Manchester with, with Katie when she was also in Sussex. So you see in the bottom line, a very simplified representation of some phenomena in developmental cognition for children. So the first year, it's, this is about language, of course, language acquisition and development. The first year is primarily phonetic discrimination and learning. Second year is about perceptual category learning and of course vocabulary learning for concrete words primarily. And then we look at more complex stages in the third year, which is language production, multi-word utterances, and uh, of course, abstract words. And you can see here, we try to map this into experiments and collaborating with these uh, baby labs, we have developed many studies. I say here five plus, but by now we have many more uh, parallel experiments, including straight collaboration between uh, developing, replicating human cognition experiments and then uh, designing robust experiments. So this is a, a picture from a video from uh, Linda Smith and, and Larissa Samuelson's lab a few years ago. They did an experiment where they showed that uh, children actively use their body to even better learn to words. For example, in the case the object being named is not visible in scene. So by moving your body left and right as a child, you start learning to do some kind of mapping. And what we did, we also built a computation model, which is, I think, what I want to show now in the video. Eventually, 
Okay, so I hope you are convinced that it is possible to teach robots to learn to understand words, in particular grounded concrete words related to color features, shapes, and so on, by using this methodology. But the real challenge, which is very relevant here uh, in our project, is how can you teach the robot to understand a concept like uh, one, two or three, or happy, sad, or democracy, freedom, if there is no way to perceptually represent the concept of one. So I, if I see a red ball, if I see a piano, if I see a table, if I see a person, if I see a, a planet, there is perceptually no way I can do the mapping. So how can we do this? How can we use, uh, what strategy can we use? So the answer is in developmental psychology or in human cognition. How do we teach children to count, for example? Number counting is the example I'm going to focus on today. We do this by actually adding a feature which you wouldn't think of in, in the sense if you had to really from scratch uh, decide how I'm going to teach this baby to count. We, for example, evolved strategies where we use finger counting. We teach the, the child to use its fingers. The different cultures use different strategies, but they all share some kind of finger counting. Then we use pointing. We ask children to touch objects and so on. And in fact, in our approach, which we call developmental robotics, we model the development of abstract word learning by following the same mechanisms. So in one experiment, which I'm going to describe in some level of detail, we do finger counting and another experiment we look at pointing here in the middle. Another experiment is actually put together this, and this was done by my PhD student, uh, Leszek Peshina, who finished his PhD yesterday, by the way. Uh, he combined the two together and then we did work on uh, uh, learning words with some kind of motor abstractions like use. I can write with a pen, I can paint with a paintbrush, but I can also use the pen, I can use a brush. And I can use a plan or I can use an idea if we want to go further up in the hierarchy of abstract uh, abstractions. So let's focus on one example to give an idea how this works. So the robot here is trained to count the fingers and also to do simple operations, two plus two. So you will see slowly the robot will perform two and then say two and then it's asked to continue two by two, two plus two, and then it will get to four in a moment. Slowly, but it will get there. In particular, what we did here, we compared different strategies when teaching robots to count. In the training setup, first condition is when the robot is only asked to perform this movement in sequence and in silence. Second condition, number sequence only, the robot is asked to say one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Sequence learning without body movement. Of course, the third one is the one you saw in the video. The robot is trained to do one, one, two, one, two, three, up to 10. And what we do, these are neural networks with an internal layer, which we call hidden layer. It's a recurrent layer because you are learning a sequence and you need memory. What matters here is that if we look at the internal representation of the words or the numbers in this brain of the robot, if we look at the condition on the left, which is the robot or condition three that counts while moving its fingers, you can see that this uh, diagram represents the similarity between concepts. So things which have a close branch are similar. Numbers concept, which have to go high up in the hierarchy of this clustering algorithm, then it means they are very different. So no surprise here. One is similar to two, two is similar to three. One is almost similar to four, a bit further down here in the hierarchy. And then one is very different from uh, nine, 10 and so on. So the robot has learned the numbers are close to each other in terms of the sequence. But if you look here on the right, this is the internal network representation activations when the robot only learns to do to say sequences one two three four without its fingers so what's the difference here you can still say the robots learn all robots in all three conditions can do the task but what's interesting now is that the similarity is more related to you will see phonetic number words so six and seven have a s, s 
sound. So they are grouped together. By chance, they're also near each other in terms of space, but two and 10, which are numerically very far from each other, share some level of similarities because we have two, 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 10, right? So if we want to help robots to understand that numbers is not about sound, but it's about sequentiality in this case. And then later when we combine also the pointing is about understanding things in a sequence and quantities and so on, we need to do this. Of course, this is early work that we did and we hope in this uh, network, we extend this further, in particular, the stronger collaboration with developmental roboticists. So in our approach, I think what we can bring to the team is an expertise on human-centered AI. Many experiments have a person involved in the, in the experiment. We follow the ethics, of course, the procedures for this. We focus on the importance of extending and exploiting embodiment, which is linked to Anna's presentation, for example, that shows that embodiment is important also in abstract words. And then, of course, we have shown uh, in, in different studies that you can combine number learning Word learn, concrete word learning, and uh, more recently, we are looking at trust. And our methods, some of them at least, allow a strong direct comparison with experimental data from developmental psychology. For, for what concerns collaboration between the robotics lab in Manchester and us in Warsaw, in uh, Aarhus, and Rome, there are many opportunities. Micro -twinning, twinnings are the obvious one. Of course, we will. Uh, have a, a workshop in computational models, interdisciplinary methods. Uh, we hope to involve Alessandro Di Nuovo, who is my neighbor here in Sheffield, to do some of the work with us, uh, also for the micro twinnings and for the workshop at summer school we have to organize. Uh, we have a new project in, in Manchester. It's a UK program on trustworthy robots. And within trust, we are looking at explainable AI, so we can use our methods to explain abstract concepts, for example. And we have two ongoing uh, Marie Curie ETN projects here, and if we have micro teaming guests from uh, Warsaw, they will be likely involved in the activities here. But this is only half of the story. This is our robots and students here because TAI is going to take over now on the developmental uh, group expertise. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I apologize for any background noise. I've got children home learning and part of it sounds quite hilarious at the minute, so I'm not quite sure why. Must be pretty good. OK, so over to humans. I'm Thea Cameron Faulkner. Um, I work at the University of Manchester. The affiliations are on the top of the slide there. So a lot of my research is in the Lucid Centre, which is a collaboration between a range of institutions, all looking at language development. Thank you. OK, so my current research background, I'm always a bit of a gate crasher, I feel. Um, so I don't really work so much in the embodied approach or abstract concepts. A lot of my work is looking um, at the role of parent-child interaction in the early language development across cultures. So I look at um, very young children now, I've gone younger as I've gone along, um, looking at naturalistic interactions. And specifically, I'm interested in the link between these interactions around pre-linguistic communicative gestures. And Angelo is really interested to see your robot doing the reaching when it was looking at the object as the object learning. So these kind of gestures and early vocabulary development. So for example, in a recent study, we found that contingent talk, that's the talk that the caregiver um, produces that's temporally and semantically related to an infant gesture, like showing something or reaching for something or pointing at something. This kind of talk to the infant predicts vocabulary development at 18 months. So far, I've only looked at contingent talk, but there's so much more to look at, which hopefully I can um, entice you to uh, collaborate with. Thank you. So as I say, I'm gate crashing because I haven't done much on abstract words as yet, but I'm really interested to be in this group because it's most definitely an area of um, considerable importance. So focusing on input and interaction then in the development of abstract words in early language development is an area that um, I can see some collaborative opportunities for. There's quite a lot in the literature and there's people in this audience who know a whole lot more about it than I do in terms of um, abstract words. So we've mentioned Remember already there's decontextualized speech, there's bootstrapping, there's all different approaches of looking at abstract words. But what I would like to do is look at much younger children as opposed to the older ones. Obviously, it's all later in development that these words begin to come through, but it must be the case that the children are hearing them in one form or another quite early in development. 
And typically we view child directed speech, that's that specific register of talking to children, has been quite restricted in terms of the lexicon. But the question is, how restricted is it when we look at it in different ways? For example, looking at the types of abstract words we might see there early in development. And as you'll see in a minute, there's plenty of data available for us to look at. Thank you. Okay, so um, I thought something that might be interesting to collaborate with is to investigate vocabulary use. So this is looking at the mother speech in pre-linguistic data uh, developmental interactions. So we have data of infants aged nine to 12 months in three distinct cultures, Bengali, Chinese, and uh, British English. Um, and so we could use this as an existing data set. So if you want to have a look at this, Kevin Fortner tell, uh, tells you a little bit more. So what we've done in these kind of approaches, as you can see in the image there, we've got the mother and the um, infant playing with a set of toys. We transcribe, we code, and we analyze. So it's extremely rich data, which would allow us to take a multimodal approach. So as I said, the, the approach that I usually work in is a socio-constructivist approach but it fits very nicely with ecological approaches and embodied approaches. So bringing those together would be really exciting. Thank you. And we have finished as a Manchester team. So time for questions, if any. Okay, so <laughs> well, we apologize for the internet connection and uh, therefore also would like to give precedence to the people at, um, that are observing us on YouTube. Uh, um, you can ask even on, uh, we have a little bit more time, I think. So you can ask about uh, what you have missed. Uh, um, what Angela was showing was a, a robot who learned uh, to count uh, either using um, robot's fingers or uh, without it. And uh, I actually have an, a question about it. Maybe it will clarify also for the, uh, for the others. Uh, do you have to use different neural network architecture when you are dealing with abstract concepts? Or you, can you see that the neural networks are sort of used in a different way in the models for concrete and abstract concepts? I wouldn't say so. What we changed is the modality in input and the way this is uh, connected, basically. And uh, we have this view that you need some kind of hierarchical grounding, at least for, for a basic... Some concepts must be concrete and grounded to, for you to start to uh, make us abstractions. And of course, once you have a mini vocabulary, some directly grounded, some indirectly grounded, you know, combinations of simple words that define another word, then you can use the full power of language generativity or productivity to generate new, new concepts, which is in line again with what uh, we had in the first two talks, where there is a relationship between abstract words and, for example, modality of acquisition via language. But to be able to use language productivity to generate new abstract meanings or more abstractions, you need to start from something with the feet on the ground, which is the whole point of grounding. This is our approach. Great, thank you. Anna, you had a question? Yes, uh, very interesting talks both. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question to Angelo uh, that pertains grounding of, um, uh, grounding of numbers in finger counting. How about um, bigger numbers? So, because one possibility is that, yeah, we thought about is in the case of um, small numbers, you use the finger, in the case of higher numbers, language plays a major role. So the mouth could be more activated, for example. Could it be a way to, but, could there be a way to test this or to, I don't know. No, definitely so. We only looked at small numbers. That's why it was easy for us to link it to fingers, like you said. We haven't really sat and, and discussed uh, how to do this because then of course it depends on the opportunity maybe this is this could be a topic for a micro twinning you know see how this can be scaled up to numbers i remember from work that we did uh, with uh, kenny coventry on quantifiers and so on it's also you know it, it's related to way, even in, in psychology experiments if i have a set of a setting an experiment that goes from one to ten using 
uh, the, the embodiment effects that space related effects like a snark, you know, you get uh, high numbers on the right. So, so 10 is on the right, one is on the left. But if I use in my set a sample of from one to 100, 10 becomes faster to be recognized in a snark effect on the left because it's a small number. So I guess there must be some kind of contextual resetting of this uh, embodiment strategy which uh, we hope we could demonstrate also in this kind of robots. You know, it's contextualized to your set and so on. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, other questions? <clears throat> um, if I can also add uh, from one of the micro twinnings, uh, it would be good to think of a project that links together Thea's expertise and work. For example, Thea already mentioned the pointing and look at the experiments in, in pointing in, in not only in number learning, but it could be abstract words, you know, some aspects of abstract words. Um, if there are no, no questions, I, I have a question to Thea uh, about the decontextualized speech. Um, how do you I mean, can you can you just uh, give us a little peek into how how to start to study it? Yeah, I am. Um, it's more it's more sort of focusing. That was more focusing on work that's been done already. So there's the studies that have been done from a research team at Otago looking at you know the use of uh, talking about the past and the future. That kind of contextualized talk, which I assume would also have an element of um, abstract contracts in them more than you would get with the, the toy play situations that I look at. So, um, yeah, I mean, even I think in interactions like these, where it looks very grounded, it's very much based on, on objects and toys, you still get some elements of bringing in past events or what children are going to do with toys and everything. So it's something, as I say, I don't know a huge amount about but I've never looked. And so it's going to be really interesting to kind of challenge this notion that these pre-linguistic interactions are all about the here and now. That's what we always assume they're about the here and now. If a baby's playing with a toy, all we're talking about is the here and now, but I'm not sure that that's always the case. And as I say, I haven't really looked, so it'll be interesting to see what's going on there in naturalistic interaction. Right, it will, it will be fascinating to see how actually uh, the, the concepts are linked, uh, something from, Angelo's uh, older work uh, on uh, sort of symbolic theft uh, that could probably uh, uh, help us link what we have uh, grounded in uh, in the um, experience, immediate experience uh, through grammar, uh, syntax of language to uh, the concepts that are more abstract. I think it will be really fascinating also for, for our developing of our models. Thank you. 